So um, I, I have one actually for, uh, for Anne. Um, I was interested in um, the, the use of the word story. Um, do, you, do you think that calling feedback a story meant that people were more willing to, to sort of share their experience rather than something like more like, um, like boring, like, like response or feedback? Yeah, that, that's the, um, the term used by Care Opinion themselves. And I suppose um, it's meant to reflect the feeling that it's their experience. Um, this is how I perceived it, um, because um, within a care setting, obviously it, it's a lot of, um, it, it's a very unequal power relationship, and we're kind of used to listening to doctors and, you know, listening to the care professionals, um, and I think the, it's all part of valuing the, the patient or the citizen story, or their perspective. That's, I think that's, that's what they were coming from. It seems to have worked anyway. <laughs> Thanks. Luca, Luca Cernuzzi from Paraguay. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, uh, very interesting, uh, uh, the first presentation about the motivation of people for uh, be being involved. Uh, and uh, I would like to, to uh, make a question to Christian. Uh, based on uh, your uh, analysis, or uh, at least uh, your, on your perception, which was uh, or which is uh, the main motivation for uh, participants uh, uh, that are involved in particip participatory budgeting uh, processes? Um, do, do you mean from um, the citizen's perspective or from a city that decides to undertake participatory budgeting, or uh, both? No. Mainly for people that are involved in uh, presenting proposal for this. OK. Um, so it varies a lot. and. Um, the way I, I view it is there's, there's usually one um, technology openness champion within each, each small bureaucracy that, that starts lobbying internally uh, for them to adopt this. And then um, well, what's most interesting that after a couple of iterations and, and other bureaucrats start to, to kind of lose fear of engaging with the public, um, that's when it really starts uh, catching on. and. Um, a lot of what happens too is, is uh, all this, especially in cities, the, these networks are very tight knit and they talk a lot to each other. So at conference similar to this, except at the city level, um, they'll, they'll talk about an exercise that they did and how happy they were from it. So a lot of, of, of the expansion of the tool was word of mouth. Hi, uh, hi Christian. So I have a question. Uh, many of the participatory budgeting processes going on in most places today are still very much uh, per um, in person, uh, a sort of a physical sort of exercise. Do you have any, uh, any experience of uh, how shifting that process to, a, let's say, perhaps an e-platform or doing electronically has either um, uh, hiked the numbers of participants or uh, w w what sort of relationship have you found in places where there used to be a physical, presential sort of nature to the PB to when it has moved to, to an online sort of platform? Um, sure. Uh, so we found that, don't quote me exactly on this, but about uh, there's a four percent, like a four time increase. Uh, because most of the cities we work with, they, they already had uh, town meetings that were open to the government, to, to people where cities, where citizens could go participate in person and uh, have similar input on the budget that they do on the online form. Um, the numbers are not as massive as, as other places because granted these are small places. Uh, but I think something to note too on that, on that area is that it's a Canada as a, a very, big place where, where cities are very far from each other and people tend to live outside urban areas, a few urban areas. So I think having the online portion really, really helps uh, connect people that would be engaged anyways, but that might not want to drive an hour into town to, to participate. And thank you for your question, everyone. Thank you all for your presentations, really interesting. Um, and Cecilia, I had a question for you. Um, entonces, muchas gracias por la presentación, está todo um, bellísima. Entonces, 
I was wondering what you think the biggest opportunity is now in Italy, both at the federal level and the local level, for continuing the transparency and openness work. Before, before doing this job, uh, I worked for a central admi a public administration, and now for local. The approach is completely different, uh, because uh, um, when you work for local administration, you feel immediately the result uh, on citizens. And so this kind of tools, uh, online and offline, uh, are really used uh, and people, you feel that people is really involved because each de decision has an impact directly on the day-by-day -day life. At central level, so at, at uh, central public administration, the transparency uh, is still important, but as in, in indirect impact on citizens. So uh, it's important to open data, to put in place each process to be clear with people. But for me, it's very important to invest, first of all, at local level, because each decision the, the week after has an impact uh, tangible uh, and, and directly uh, with people. So m m in my opinion, the, 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 first, um, is, the first approach is to open as much as that as possible at each level, but uh, the investment is on local. Hi, uh, Alex Banford. I work building government uh, services. Uh, the question I want to start with uh, leads on a little bit from the Roman example of having explainers for the digital technology to, to sort of draw people in, it, which worries me because there's quite a useful design principle of thinking that no user should have to understand government services in order to interact with it. You shouldn't have to understand how government works in order to interact with it. If it's been designed in such a way that you need somebody to to kind of hold your hand to to use it, that suggests that there's a, a lack of a lack of a feedback loop between the design of the services and the usability testing that presumably goes on to see if those services are working. And I don't know if I've just misunderstood this, but I wanted to maybe ask the whole panel have you seen a situation in which government or uh, healthcare have changed their services in response to the f in response to the feedback that you're you've been talking about in each of your presentations because i think a lot of the focus has been on about how the citizen or user feels a little bit better after an interaction but not necessarily that government responds in an iterative loop and we're talking about the impacts of civic technology what's the impact In Rome, uh, uh, there was a particular situation. This new portal we released uh, two months ago um, came, uh, uh, comes after uh, 15 years that nobody changed the um, website. So the previous website was, uh, let me say, administrative center. So. Uh, it was um, a, a picture of the administration. Um, now we designed this new portal, uh, not only citizen oriented, but also service oriented. So we re engineered each process to give services to people, and then we not only restyled, but uh, redesigned the website and for us it was really important to to collect comments uh, from people because nobody was accustomed uh, to the new vision and in Rome 
we had really few people that, for example, downloaded the online certification and so on. And so the interaction with the administration um, was difficult. We, when we designed the new website, uh, we, we wanted to facilitate each interaction with administration. Rome is a really huge city also at the regional level and also the, the, the transportation and the movement are difficult and so uh, to have the possibility to download certificate to to to, um, to to get online interaction is very important for people so that's why we collected the uh, feedback and react on it also to inform citizens uh, about the, the new vision. For more than 4,000 uh, uh, comments and feedback we had, so it's not, not a huge number, but it's not a few people. Um, right, so um, for, for impact, that, that was one of the things I kind of wanted to portray was that that policy, because the way we're in direct democracy and policy makers are influenced by a variety of actors, um, so having or presuming that one tool in particular will have a policy outcome uh, might be missing a lot of other influences in, in very complex systems. So, um, so what's the impact of our tools? Well, it has to be viewed within a larger context of, of influencers, and same with, with as there are other advocacy groups that might push for a different outcome. Um, so looking at, at things like, like exemplified, like reports and, and municipal uh, officials or, or government officials at least considering feedback, it could be considered a form of impact more than um, feedback A on fixing the pool led to outcome A, fixing the pool, because there might be a lot of, of other influencing factors, such as technical difficulties or a shift in, economic, in the economics of a city. I hope that answers your question. I'm not 100% I'm not sure. <laughs> Hi, uh, um, I think one of the, the key elements of the, the Care Opinion platform is concentrating on learning and change. Um, and the the flags that I, I put up, each story is flagged according to what happens, whether it's got a response or not, and whether it leads to a change, which is it's sort of, if you like, the first level um, that you start with. But after that, um, you, you see they have um, quite a bit of social media and blogs associated with um, different NHSs as well. Um, and one of the stories that I liked in particular was um, they described how they um, were getting quite a bit of feedback in one particular um, hospital area from children who have, I, I think it was cystic fibrosis, um, that every time they were sick they had to go into hospital. Um, so they were traveling into hospital, they were using up beds, but it, the children's lives were being disrupted as well. So obviously they, they received enough feedback from this, so the, they changed the, the system of care to nurses going out into the community and delivering their antibiotics in, the, in their own homes. So they didn't have to be separated from their family and it was a lot less disruptive. And that change was led by information um, from Care Opinion. And there are, there are many examples of that on it. Sometimes, you know, there probably aren't that many changes when you consider the huge numbers of people who participate on it, but sometimes it's positive anyway. Um, and sometimes it's maybe an amalgamation of things that lead to a change later on down the road, is that the, your story doesn't stop giving after you've submitted it or even gotten a response. It's maybe over a period of six months or a year when, because it's the, the people who are in management are able to view these reports and are able to look through them as well. Um, and it can lead to, to further changes then too. Any further questions? Hi, um, my name is Saki Kumagai, World Bank. Um, thank you, I thank the panel for your presentations. I have a question to Christian. Um, trust, measuring trust in institutions, um, trust in government is extremely difficult, as you mentioned. Um, we have a research component on that, and we are encountering similar um, experiences. 
Um, since you mentioned of measuring trust in the context of participatory budgeting, um, I was wondering if you've considered uh, measuring trust using proxies such as tax. Um, I just am curious to see your, see your views. M measuring taxi, you said? Yeah, so it could be, I mean, tax is a broad area, but one of the more prom prominent proxies to measure trust or fluctuation in trust is basically looking at the tax data. It could be tax exemption, it could be a level of tax collection. Um, have you thought about it? That, that would be really interesting. Um, I don't think in the Canadian context it will work as well, um, but, but somewhere, say, like in in Colombia or even Paraguay where taxes are not collected and then seeing if after implementing one of these tools would be, and I'm just pretty much just, you know, just sharing my thoughts I'm getting. It would be very interesting to see if there's uh, an increase in, in the taxation base. Um, but again, like I don't think that would work in the Canadian context, but definitely somewhere in, in transitioning post-conflict democracies. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, there's no further questions. I think we'll wrap up there. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, thank you to our, our presenters. And as I said before, if you're feeling brave and want to join in in the photo in about 10 minutes time in the, in the foyer, that'd be brilliant. Um, if you don't want to and you want to hide, I'll probably be hiding with you. So that's, that's fine too. Thank you very much. <laughs>